geeks and geekettes, gats and gittens, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, comic book fans from all the world. Here's where you get to ask me, a seasoned, world-famous, world-renowned, world-celebrated writer of comics. You get to ask me questions about what I do for a living, and what I do for a living is I write comic books. Um, questions range all over the place this week, uh, which always makes me happy. And let's start with the first one. From Travis, will you write a sequel to Stallone's Cobra for comics? What might it be like if you did? Attached are a couple of examples from a Hungarian bootleg of a Cobra adaptation in case you missed it. it I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea that someone would do an unauthorized movie adaptation in comic book form. That takes a lot of work. They must have been pretty sure that it would sell. And uh, it's largely, you know, pretty competently done. Um, kind of suspecting Argentine artists might have been involved here. Good, good Stallone likeness. Um, would I write a sequel? Yeah, yeah, sure, I'd write a sequel to it. Um, it's not one of my favorite Stallone movies. Apparently, it's a, not a lot of people's favorite Stallone movie. I think it. Uh, he brought in um, a director that kind of went goofy. Uh, it doesn't seem to take place in anything resembling the real world. It it has its, uh, you know, good points, but. I, you know, there's a lot to question. I think this was Sly's attempt to get into, like, you know, a Lethal Weapon franchise or whatever. It was the one tough guy franchise other than the Western that he had never explored. As he told me, he will never do a Western. Uh, not because he doesn't love Westerns, but because he does, doesn't feel he's right casting for a Western. Um, and, um, but in any case, I mean, I showed it to my boys, uh, and they loved it but they were the right age. You know, they were teenagers. And I think that's who Cobra was made for. <laughs> but yeah, I'd write a Cobra comic in a heartbeat. Why not? Dara O'Sullivan, how many comic books do you own and where do you store them? Well, I haven't counted them, but I store them. The bulk of my actual comic book collection is in my closet. I have a nice walk-in closet. And uh, I store them in these uh, things called show-offs, which they don't make anymore. Uh, Starlight used to make these show-offs. They're absolutely perfect for storing comics in. And they're relatively airtight so that my closet doesn't smell like uh, an old pulp mill. <laughs> and uh, you can store the comics upright or, uh, as I do with uh, older comics, uh, pre-Silver Age, store them flat. There you go. How geeky can you get? This is this is how I store my box. My, my wife just had had it with the long boxes because they do get kind of manky after a while. And she said, it's, it's not the comics that smell, the boxes that smell. you got to get rid of them. Uh, and, and she suggested these. And they're a perfect suggestion. Uh, but I also, you know, now as far as vintage comics that I, from my childhood and stuff, as you can see from the labels on the previous ones, I got a lot of stuff from the 50s, you know, war and Western comics from the 50s and 60s, which is the bulk of my collection. Uh, comics I bought as a kid and collected through my adolescence and adulthood, I mostly sold them off or gave them away or traded them or whatever because everything was being reprinted, golden age reprints. So virtually every room in the house has shelves, you know, crammed with all kinds of books. And the bulk of those books are comic book collections, graphic albums, uh, European comic albums, things like that. So, and, uh, and then in my office, uh, most of my bookshelves are crammed with stuff I wrote. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's kind of an ego thing, but it's, it's nice to turn around from the computer screen and see a wall of books I wrote. It's encouraging. Uh, these are books I had uh, professionally bound as I went along, uh, as suggested by John Severn. You bind at least one copy of everything you've ever done. That way you have a complete collection of your entire um, output, which was a cool selection. Cool, yeah, cool suggestion. And um, so, yeah, that's that's what my comic book collection looks like. Hey, if you haven't subscribed, please do. If you have, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Subscribing really, really helps grow this channel, and it's made a dramatic difference in recent months. Wilson Chang, who are some of your favorite political cartoonists and satirists? Well, two names jump to mind, and I go back to the granddaddy, granddaddy of American political cartoonist Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast worked for newspapers back in the 1800s. 
And um, he really, for my money, I mean, there's a, you can see a lot of prior political cartoons and uh, stuff from England and stuff from France. And it all seems rather obscure. And uh, the, the cartoon is largely driven by what the, the likenesses of famous political figures and, and, the, and the, the gags are driven by what the people say. And Nast was better at just having an image, not relying on verbiage. And uh, you know I always like that. I'd rather see the picture than have a story told to me. And uh, images like this made him hugely, hugely popular in the New York press. Uh, and his work was so effective, uh, if you've never heard this, famously there was a the Tammany Hall Tigers. It was a... Uh, a gang of corrupt politicians who ran New York City, gave money to all of their pals, broke laws with impunity. Sounds kind of familiar. Um, and uh, they, it was run by a guy called Boss Tweed. And Nast's cartoons were so on the money and so understandable, even to illiterates, like recent immigrants to the United States, because he relied on imagery. And they knew who these people were in the pictures. Um, they, uh, he brought down the Tweed Ring. He is, he is given almost all credit for bringing down this corrupt cabal of politicians and businessmen and, and criminals. Um, and Tweed, after his trial was being sent to jail, uh, basically admitted that he could have gotten away with it if it wasn't for those damn pictures in the paper. And those were Thomas Nast's pictures. And, uh, the, the, the gag line for this uh, cartoon is, "'Twas him." And basically, I mean, you can understand, everybody's blaming each other. Uh, it's not my fault, I didn't do it, he did it. Uh, again, familiar. We see this all the time in politics. But he was great at imagery, uh, and obviously so absolutely beautifully drawn. The guy knew how to draw for um, newspapers, which weren't always printed on the best of paper. And he's also responsible for things that linger to this day. If you've never heard of Thomas Nast, you know his work. He is um, generally credited with the popular image of Santa Claus in the United States, which of course has become the standard image of Santa Claus worldwide. Uh, Nast also created other symbolic and iconic characters. He created the elephant to represent the Republican Party and the donkey to represent the Democrats. And uh, so, obviously, uh, a terrific influence, uh, our first great political cartoonist. And uh, I pick him because I, I like his work. It's still funny. A lot of the stuff he wrote is still funny today, uh, even if we don't get all the topical references. And, and as you can see, he's an amazing artist, absolutely amazing artist. Um, another guy who leaps to mind is uh, Pat Oliphant. And Oliphant uh, drew cartoons in newspapers. Uh, he's still with us. He's still with us. I think he's 95 years old now. But he drew comics uh, from like the late 60s into the 2000s. I, I don't know what he's done recently. But uh, looking here, I mean, he's very much of the Nast school. He has a looser, uh, more bravura style, a more cartoony style. Um, but I, I've always liked his stuff, his choice of imagery and everything else. And he's rare among political cartoonists in that I like him. I like his stuff, even though I don't always agree with him. And to me, that's a key uh, because I don't always agree with him, but I don't always disagree with him. Uh, he, you know, so many political cartoonists pick one side or the other and, and, and that's it. They're locked into an ideology. And Oliphant never seemed to be. He seemed to want to mock everybody, uh, you know, when he saw something, an injustice, or something that just didn't feel right, he would do a cartoon on it. And sometimes he was attacking people that uh, I, I admired or I, you know, didn't, but, but he always attacked them from a standpoint of, well, yeah, he has a point, you know, or at least he's coming at this honestly. It isn't just, you know, a hate piece. And uh, as you can see, I mean, uh, awesome cartoonist, absolutely awesome cartoonist. Uh, with his very own idiosyncratic style. Also, and he's Australian, by the way, even though he became huge, absolutely huge, 
in American political cartoons. I, I think for a while there, he was the most syndicated political cartoonist in the United States. Dick Kerbo <laughs> attached, attached our panels from Detective Comics number 741 during the No Man's Land storyline written by Devin Grayson and Greg Rucka. One of them inserted you into a Joker quip. What are some of your favorite insert of peers, heroes, and or friends' names into your comic work? Uh, I don't do a lot of that, but but if, if you're listening to this rather than reading it, uh, Batman is chasing Joker across rooftops. Obviously a uh, christmas theme story. It's snowing. And Joker is saying, on Dancer, on Prancer, and Vixen, ha-ha, <laughs> Vixen, yummy. Uh, and the next panel, he goes, on Donder and Dixon. And he says, Dixon? That's not a reindeer. I can 100, 1,000, bet the house on, assure you, that Devin Grayson wrote that dialogue, not Greg Rucka, <laughs> for various reasons. I have absolute proof that Devin is responsible for that gag. And as far as inserting friends and stuff, I, I don't really do a whole lot of that. Um, I think it takes people out of the story, quite frankly. John Vazalu, is there any talk during your time, was there any talk during your time at the Bat Office of separating Batman from the greater DC universe and basically making a Batverse? I always sort of found that putting Batman in the same world as superpowered beings made Batman kind of useless. If you didn't make up contrived reasons why they couldn't just pop into Gotham and help. Well, I know one guy that would have made real happy if we could have carved the, a Batverse a separate Batverse, Denny would have been very, very pleased. Denny was always about keeping the Batman universe separate. In his mind, there were two DC universes, one in which Batman was the only costume hero and one in which Batman was, you know, could fly to space with the Justice League. Um, and he did everything he could to keep his corner clean, you know, to keep it, you know, away from the rest of the stuff. I mean, uh, we would always make various suggestions about how, you know, um, the DC universe as a whole needed to be addressed, especially things like Cataclysm and Contagion and No Man's Land. Why didn't the Justice League just show up and help Batman out? And we always had to address that, come up with a reason why. Um, one of the ones I... One thing that I've, I've described this before, but Denny shot me down on was following Contagion. I'm a logistics guy, not Contagion. Following Cataclysm, we needed Wayne Manor back in place. Now, Wayne Manor had been destroyed in the earthquake that knocked down most of Gotham. We needed Wayne Manor back in place. But, but I said, you know, how can you bring in a construction crew to rebuild the manor the way it was and they don't discover the cave underneath? I mean, there's no way they would miss that. You know, because they're going to have to dig a new foundation and put pilings down. And they're going to run into that cave. And I said, what if, what if they build it off-site? They build the whole mansion off-site on a pad, right? <laughs> and um, so it's not on the main Wayne property. It's somewhere else. And then they come in the next day to do some finishes, you know, maybe you know, put a little mortar between a brick or finish doing a little painting on some trim and the, and the manor's gone. The pad, the whole freaking building is gone. And, and then we see Bruce and Alfred arriving at the manor. It's back in place. It's right back where it used to be. This brand new rebuilt manor is, is back on the same site above the cave. And we just hint, just the subtlest hint that Superman moved it overnight. And Denny was like, no. No, he just, he wouldn't go for it. So that's the degree to which he wanted it separated. Yeah, I think that um, if you mix Batman in too much, it diminishes him. But he's Batman. It's hard to diminish Batman. Uh, there's enough Batman titles, certainly, and there always has been, to sort of create a, a barrier or a suspension of disbelief that Batman is alone in, in the superhero universe in his own titles. And I think you just sort of have to play along. Crenshaw, F-A-O, or Crenshaw, F-A-O. Um, what do you think are the necessary elements for a good detective story? What are the respective challenges to writing detective stories and novels versus comics? I don't, I don't 
it's not really a big difference. The demands of writing a good detective story are the same if it's comics, movies, television, radio, whatever. Um, now, now the, the, there's a difference. I mean, you want to write a detective story. Is your detective story about the detective or is it about the mystery or is it about both? Uh, you can lean one way or the other. To my, For my money, mystery stuff today leans way too much toward uh, the character driven. It's way too much about the main character and not enough about the, the plot. Plot suffers when you concentrate on character too much. Um, you, for a good detective story, you need to balance between... And the thing is, is your, is your detective story even a mystery? Uh, or is it, uh, like so many private eye stories, a story about you know lies and deception, and, uh, a, a statement on the frailty and... Uh, vileness of human nature. Um, so maybe the, maybe as in Raymond Chandler, Raymond Chandler's writing, the mystery takes a back seat to uh, those subjects, uh, both the detective's character and his, uh, his exploration of a seedy uh, night dark world. Uh, you know, that's up to you as an emphasis. Um, and detectives can come in all types. And of course you've got to make your te- detective a character You've got to make him memorable. You have to give him him or her flaws and foibles and uh, you know interesting things about them so that the reader wants to keep reading them. Uh, I mean, your detective in your story should always be the smartest guy in the story. Uh, maybe he leads with his heart every once in a while, but he always ultimately figures it out, uh, you know, unless you're writing some kind of weird anti-mystery. And... And then you've got, of course, the whodunit elements. And if you're writing a, a mystery story, you've got to kind of work backwards. You have to have your mystery resolved before you start. You, you have to, and that's, for me, is the toughest thing about a mystery uh, story, is um, you've got to know the ending before you can start the beginning. And how are you going to get there? And, and uh, because, you know, in a... In, there's, there's several kinds of mysteries. There's the police procedural mystery, which your detective characters are cops. Uh, and they're dealing with evidence in the way the cops do. They're dealing with forensics and canvassing for witnesses, and, uh, you know, whatever, you know, uh, uh, working confessions out of uh, perpetrators. And, and then you have, you know, character mysteries, you know, Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot. And these are whodunit, fair, what they call fair play mysteries in which, all of the elements, um, not particularly in Sherlock Holmes, though, because you'd have to be some kind of freaking genius to know everything Holmes knows. But uh, within a fair play whodunit, uh, all of the elements are presented to you. So you could solve the mystery, you know, along with the detective or even prior to the detective. You're given enough information. It's not, it's not like a Scooby-Doo mystery where there's only one likely suspect. You know, generally you're given a number of suspects, a number of motives. And, and but you're given enough clues along the way that you could figure it out. And that's like the attraction of a whodunit. And then a whodunit mystery, you very much need to know how it all works. Um, it's got to read logically, as logically backwards as it does forwards. And I used to have a friend who would read whodunits. He'd read it forward, and then he'd go back and read the chapters in reverse and find all the loopholes. <laughs> and, 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 you know... Uh, gaps in the plot line where hey, this couldn't happen. You know, this guy couldn't have been in two places at once or whatever. Uh, so you've got to work it out seamlessly so that it all makes sense. And, and, and the thing is, this can lead to some kind of, sometimes lead to like really mechanical writing and you want to avoid that. You want to still make it a story without the reader aware that they're reading a story, that they're, they're experiencing these events along with the characters. So, I mean, if you can write a good mystery story, if anyone can write a good mystery story, I mean, I, my hat's off to you. I, I've written a few. They're tough. They're tough. They're almost as tough as trap stories, which I will get into in just a few questions. J. Morgan Neal. Hey, hey, Morgie. Um, war hero Neville Brand played one of my favorite slob heroes, trademark Chuck Dixon, Reese Bennett in Laredo, and he became my ideal choice to play and voice Ben Grimm. What are your thoughts on Mr. Brand and whether you think he would have done right by Ben? And do you have an actor you think would do a great thing? Um, yeah, Neville Brand was actually the second most decorated GI, American GI of World War II, right after Audie Murphy. 
And um, when he didn't have Audie Murphy's good looks, uh, kind of a you know Neanderthal appearance, uh, by all accounts, a really, really nice guy, uh, if you weren't on the other end of his bayonet. Uh, and, um, you know, the kind of Neanderthal looks and the gravelly voice made him perfect for playing heavies. He played heavies in lots and lots of things. But I agree with uh, Morgie that uh, Reese Bennett was a, a big part of my childhood. He was a Texas Ranger, and uh, he was a bit of a goofball character, which was unusual for Brand. I, I think he was the first time Brand had ever taken a shot at comedy after playing like Al Capone and Escape Convicts and, and you know, uh, World War II tough guys. And um, I, I always found the guy really funny uh, as, as Reese Bennett, you know, kind of playing against type. And, uh, but the rest of the time playing super, super duper tough guys. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, he would have been a great Ben Grimm. Uh, you, know, you know, his voice alone, that, that gravelly voice, which I can still hear. But when I was a kid, the actor I thought would be perfect for the thing was um, another guy, uh, Aldo Ray. I, 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 he had that same kind of um, timber to his voice. And uh, physically, he was a big guy, a big broad-shouldered guy. And I thought he would make a cool thing if they were ever to make a, a thing movie. I always kind of heard his voice in my head until I met Jack Kirby. And then from then on, I heard Jack Kirby's voice in my head <laughs> whenever I whenever I would read the thing. Uh, because obviously the thing was such a stand-in for Jack. Ofe Ofe, in one of your recent videos, a viewer asked you if your views against Johnny Quest had maybe changed. You responded possibly because of your work on Scooby-Doo and if they paid you well, you would maybe reconsider. My question is, would you feel the same now as well about the, the Ninja Turtles? Now, now, I want to clear up. I mean, it's not like if they paid me enough money, I'd write Johnny Quest. I mean, it really wouldn't be about money. Uh, money be nice. But, I mean, I think I was half joking there. Uh, it would be if, if the project was interesting. You know, if the artist was good and... You know, they were really wanted me to do it and really wanted me to take a second look at Johnny Quest. I certainly would because I had done that with, with Scooby Doo. And, and Scooby Doo, they paid me regular rate. I mean, they didn't pay me more money to do Scooby Doo. The, uh, the uh, reason to do Scooby Doo for me was is the, uh, Joan Hilty, the editor, had basically thrown the gauntlet down or, or more like slapped me in the face with the gauntlet and <laughs> said, I'm assigning you a Scooby Doo story. Like I couldn't say no. And I didn't say no. So that was. Uh, but anyway, the turtles. Yeah, I take a shot at the turtles. My kids like turtles growing up, and uh, why not? If they were to ask me, uh, especially if I got to work with Frank Fosco, who does a lot of turtles, um, I take a shot at it. I'm certainly because because my kids were into the turtles, and we I watched all the movies with them. Um, I'm familiar with the characters, certainly. So it's it's a possibility. Probably never happened, but you know, I'm not going to say no. Dean Kurji. What are your thoughts on Doctor Who? Have you ever been a fan? If so, who are your favorite doctors and some of your favorite episodes? Um, I'm a Tom Baker guy. Uh, I watched a little bit of Who. I don't know. I can't remember who the first Who was. I watched a little bit of it when I was a kid. And um, it, was, it didn't last very long here in the United States in syndication. So I saw a little bit. It was interesting. I was interested in anything that involved aliens and time travel. And then uh, in the 70s, uh, PBS started running Doctor Who again with Tom Baker, I guess based on the fact that Baker was enormously popular in the UK as the Doctor. And of course, he continued on for many seasons. If I'm not mistaken, he's probably the longest running guy to play Who. and Or, I'm sorry, play the Doctor. And yeah, I was a fan. I, I watched I watched it every week. And in fact, I rewatched some episodes recently from my season 12 or something like that. Um, I always enjoyed the stories. I enjoyed his performance particularly, uh, as so many people did. And um, when they brought it back recently, I watched up through the end of Matt Smith's run, and I didn't see any reason to continue after that because of what I was... I think I might have watched... What was it? Peter Caproni? I'm getting his name wrong. I may have watched a couple after, and just it wasn't for me. Uh, they had altered the uh, franchise too much. But I watched, you know, all of the uh, more recent iterations, you know, David Tennant and Matt Smith 
and I enjoyed them as well. Um, it's, it's a franchise that's cool. Like I said, time travel. You had me at time travel. Love time travel. And uh, it was always fun stuff, always intelligently written uh, for a show ostensibly that was created for children. Uh, it's rather sophisticated. And which is why it had such longevity because it didn't talk down to kids. Um, it introduces, you know, scientific concepts and things like that to kids in a palatable way. Uh, it's educational in that way. In, in some, and also the, uh, the emphasis on intelligence, on, on having an education and knowing things. Uh, Doctor Who is not an action hero. He's a guy who knows a lot of stuff. And, uh, and he's courageous and unflappable and all the rest of it. But, Largely, it's his knowledge that gets him out of things. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a good thing to teach children, I think. Uh, but to do it in such a way that it's not pandering, that the kids had to think a little harder uh, with this material and learn a little bit. And yeah, a lot of the science is complete bull. Uh, it's techno, techno babble, but, you know, what the heck? At least you're introducing the kids into um, concepts like physics and biology and things like that. So anyway, you know, long answer to uh, what to a short question. Yeah, I like Doctor Who. <laughs> not a Whovian, not a big fan. I could have talked for hours about Doctor Who, but yeah, I, I dig the franchise. Brick Hard Slab wants to know. Brick asks, you mentioned a Ripperverse game. Is that going to be a tabletop role-playing game? If so, how does one become a beta tester? <laughs> Can you give any details? For example, is it going to be D20, crunchy, not crunchy, based on an existing game system? Uh, I, I love superhero games and can't wait to see what this looks like. Well, I think it'll um, it'll be as crunchy or uncrunchy. It depends on how much milk you put on it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to any of those questions because I, I don't even understand what those terms mean. Uh, I'm not into gaming. I'm not a big gamer. Uh, my youngest son is. Um but yeah, I mean, um, Eric mentioned to me in passing that they were very interested in that universe of, of gameplay. Uh, and uh, I introduced him to some people that I know, even though I'm not in gameplay, I know people that are. Uh, people that I know in that industry, and he's talking with them. You know, he's been talking with them about how to put this thing together. Uh, with the success of Ripaverse, as you can imagine, there are a number of uh, game developers who would be anxious to jump in here with him. Another question from Brick. And he starts with another question. When you write a story, say for the Ripperverse or another independent guide, do you ever use a story you wanted to use for Punisher or Batman or whatever? Not one, not one you've already done and are doing again with the names filed off, but a story or concept you think would make a great story with the new world. Um, I have not done that recently. I have in the past used concepts that because um, a writer never wants to waste anything, and you particularly don't want to waste a plot line or a great set action piece. But I've never, um, I've, I've I've never been in the habit of like pitching a Spider-Man story, and then when it gets rejected, rewriting it as a Batman story and going across the street. Um, but I have used um, ideas that were rejected or I didn't get to use. The, the one that I can think of is. Um, there was a, uh, a G.I. Joe arc that I took a lot of the elements that I had put in the rejected uh, Expendables 2 movie treatment, uh, the rewrites for Expendables 2. I took a lot of the action set pieces and setups from that story and, and used them in G.I. Joe. So uh, I have done that. Every writer's done that. Uh, you, you never want to throw an idea away or it's always in the back of your head. And since you thought of it, you know, for me, if you come up with a plot, that's 90% of the writing. The rest of the job's easy. Dan Battles. I noticed with issues 1821 of Guy Gardner Warrior, you wrote the first two parts of Emerald Fallout while Bo Smith wrote the last two parts. Was that a fun experience? Speaking of Emerald Fallout, what were you th your thoughts on DC turning Hal Jordan into Parallax? I've never found Hal boring. Do you understand the disdain some fans of Green Lantern have for Hal? Um, yeah, Guy Gardner Warrior, I was basically brought on uh, when sales didn't, you know, accumulate the way they thought and they wanted to do a different direction. They wanted, so I was brought on to write a, a Guy Gardner Year One. Uh, and my main attraction to coming on to the character was because I thought the character hadn't been uh, well presented 
to present as sort of two-dimensional. And the fact that he was somewhat of a direct character and implied that he was a political conservative, uh, or at least not a bleeding heart liberal, uh, I thought he had been uh, badly used, uh, misused. And I thought there's there's more to this character. Uh, and so uh, Kevin Dooley hired me to do uh, Guy Gardner, basically Guy Gardner year one, and talks about his uh, childhood uh, and how he becomes Guy Gardner. And growing up in Baltimore and things like that. So I filled in a lot of his background that never been filled in before. And, uh, but my main reason for wanting to come on was to get to work with Joe Staten because I, I like Joe a lot. And I love working with him. And uh, so that was my main impetus for wanting to be on the book. And, and Kevin certainly knew that and Joe certainly knew that. Uh, but after a while, um, the, the, um, you know, I, I guess sales picked up with the origin story, so they, they kept me on. But the uh, after a while, it, it, Kevin decided that Joe Staten was over. His comic career was over, and, and people didn't want him anymore. He's blaming him for the uh, sales not rising. And, and also, he wanted to alter the book and and change Guy Gardner's you know look and persona and everything else, and, and came up with this idea for Guy Gardner Warrior to try to rescue the book. These things never work, but um, but the worst thing for me was is that he uh, he fired Joe, but didn't tell me because he knew that once I knew that Joe was no longer in the book, my interest would wane, and it did. I, I sent Joe. I called Joe and said I was sending him some reference material. I was faxing faxing him. That's how long ago this was. I was faxing him some reference material, and Joe said I. I don't waste your time. I'm no longer on the book. And I was like, what? I apologized. I said, I didn't know. I had no idea. Uh, this was kept a secret from me. And apparently I'd written a number of issues thinking they were going to Joe and they weren't. They were going to whoever. And um, so I, I told Kevin that I no longer wanted to write the title, but that I would hold on. I wouldn't leave him in the lurch. And I would hold on through the uh, and and you know, continue writing a few stories, but, you know, he needed to get a replacement. And I thought the best replacement, particularly for the direction that he was taking Guy Gardner, was Bo Smith. Uh, my buddy Bo, I knew, was a huge Guy Gardner fan and would really like the direction. He would he would get into Guy Gardner Warrior, and he did. Uh, he gave the book a new look, a new tone, a new everything. Big, big facelift with Bo coming on. And working with terrific artists like Mitch Bird and guys like that, and um, he kept the book going for a while. But uh, I think Bo's arrival kept it from cancellation uh, because of Bo's fresh take, and also the fact that Bo uh, Bo is a as as he refers to himself a shameless self promoter. So Bo got the word out there to his own fan base and and rescued the book for a while. So all was cool and all were happy. Now, as far as Hal Jordan, I never found Hal Jordan boring. Um, I don't know. How can you be a Green Lantern fan and not like Hal Jordan? <laughs> it's like being a Spider-Man fan and not liking Peter Parker. Um, I guess there's some of them now, too. Uh, so, yeah, I don't. I didn't like the idea of them turning him into a villain. I, don't, I didn't like the way they got rid of a lot of these uh, characters. You know, the Flash is tried for murder. You know, Green Lantern becomes a uh, arrogant demigod. You know, out to rule the universe. Uh, it, it's all. It was all part of the uh, deconstruction of the heroes that was going on in the period. And I, I really didn't like any of it. Um, at least Oliver Queen escaped that fate of being turned into a bad guy. Jason Shepard. My question is about one of my favorite comics tropes: death traps. What's the best death trap you've ever created for a character? And what's the best one ever? I'm with you. I love a good death trap. But they're usually disappointing. First of all, they're very hard to set up. Very hard to put together. And um, I think they largely come out of, uh, for Batman, come out of the uh, 66 TV show. Where, you know, every week uh, you'd have a cliffhanger where it was either a literal cliffhanger or he was facing some danger or more often an actual trap. Here it's a gigantic rat trap. Um, so I think that 
traps became associated with Batman, but traps a lot of times associated with, you know, I've seen traps for Superman. I've seen traps for lots of these characters. Famously, Spider-Man trapped under that giant piece of machinery while the water rises around him. You know, great stuff like that. And um, and I've written a number of traps, uh, almost all of, for Batman, all of them with Graham Nolan, because Graham Nolan likes a good trap too. But traps aren't that easy to write, so uh, and, and the resolutions of them are even harder. So it's not something that a lot of writers do. It's like I was talking earlier about mysteries. A lot of writers don't like writing a workable mystery. It's too hard. And writing a trap that's convincing, suspenseful, and has a resolution that makes sense without you know relying on a special gadget or whatever as James Bond. James Bond always seems to be carrying exactly the item he needs to get out of whatever trap he was in. Um, there's a a really funny movie called Ship Ahoy. It's a it's an MGM uh, musical comedy with Red Skelton in the lead. Red Skelton plays a pulp author, and he's so prolific that he dictates. He writes three pulp uh, monthlies simultaneously, and he dictates them to three different secretaries. Uh, and he'll move from one to the other in, in a manic fashion, all the while uh, swallowing vitamins to keep himself awake. And <laughs> it's it's got a great scene where he's talking about how one of his characters, Wonder Boy, is trapped in a cabin in the woods, uh, tied to a chair, and the cabin is on fire. And the chapter ends with him, you know, how will he ever get out of this, you know, as the flames lit closer and closer and closer. And then all of his secretaries are whispering behind him, how's he going to get out of this one? How's he going to get out of it? And they're really into the story as he's dictating. And then, uh, and then he begins dictating again and says, chapter three, after escaping from the log cabin, uh, Wonder Boy moved into the forest. And the secretary's all like, oh, like this again. <laughs> so you never want to set up a trap that's easy to get out of or avoid the character getting out of it. You, the, the, tr the clever trap is, um, it, it's just important that the, the trap be clever as the escape be clever. And so many times in stories, the trap is simply, if you can run fast enough, you can get out of it. <laughs> It's not really a resolution. It's not really using your wits. It's not using anything special. There's nothing terribly heroic about it. Um, I go back once again to Die Hard 3. Die Hard 3 had a number of traps and puzzles and things like that that the heroes had to work out in order to thwart the criminal or save their own lives. And they did it through wit. You know, yeah, they were shooting and punching and kicking and all the rest of it, but they had to use their intelligence. They had to use be resourceful in order to uh, get out of these traps and thwart these puzzles and move the story along. And it wasn't always easy, and it involved a, a wider variety of skill sets than, than merely the use of violence. Now, two of the traps that I'm Graham and I are most proud of are um, it was a... a a trap in which, you know, Batman is, uh, he's, he's cut, he's bleeding, he's slowly bleeding to death, and he's tied to a buoy out in the middle of Gotham Harbor, and the sharks are coming. It's being surrounded by sharks, and it's like, how does, how do you, how do you get out of this? You know, a uh, simple thing would be he just strains and strains and breaks the chains, and sprays the water with shark repellent and swims away, but we didn't do that. We came up with, a, he utilizes the elements around him in order to escape from this inescapable trap. Another one occurred in Detective Comics 700. Um, and in, in 700, we really wanted something special. And Graham said, we got to have a trap. we got to have a trap. And Graham said, I, I, I was listening to this Lone Ranger radio show. And they had this really, really good trap. And he described part of it to me. And I thought, don't describe anymore because I don't want to lift the whole trap. I don't want to lift how the Lone Ranger got out of it. Uh, and so we put it in and it a, uh, features a, a well Robin and Batman are trapped in, in the desert. It's an oasis well. And it's slowly, well not even slowly, rather quickly filling with water. And the top of it is sealed off. And uh, that was a cool trap because not only was the danger of drowning, but you're dealing with claustrophobia. You're also dealing with the increase in the air pressure. 
that as the water rises, pressing the air above it, closer and closer, uh, tighter and tighter, air pressure going up higher and higher and higher, um, Batman and Robin are risking unconsciousness. So they, they'll be knocked unconscious long before the water rises up high enough to drown them. And, uh, and, and Graham and I were, were really proud of all the traps we did, but, and, and most proud that we could contribute new pra- traps to the Batman universe, something that I really feel is, um, is lacking in, in so many uh, characters like this, where, you know, a, it's like the locked door mystery. You know, it's like, yeah, these are cool. If you do them and you have the right resolution, it's cleverly done. Uh, it's good. Another one I was real happy with was uh, in Robin 10. Um, a, a Tim Drake saves himself. I think it's, yeah, it's Tim Drake saves himself. It would be Tim. Tim Drake and Dick Grayson as Robin team up in this, you know, some sort of multiverse time travel thing. And uh, Tim Drake saves himself by his knowledge um, that he is forced in a situation where he, to, to save the day, he has to swim through a piranha infested water. And uh, he just jumps right in because he realizes from his reading that this is a variety of piranha that do not feed on living flesh. So not really a trap, but he saved himself by his wits, intelligence, and something that he knew, his knowledge about that, kids. Uh, <laughs> anyway, hey, Spin Rack is on Discord. You can go to Discord and communicate with the growing community of fans of comics at Spin Rack. Graham and I stop by now and then to offer critiques, words of advice, words of iron, and uh, just communicate with all, all the folks there. And you can just uh, click on the old uh, QR code here. It'll take you right to Spin Rack Discord, and you can join in the fun. So that's it for me this week. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, all, all the rest. And unless I uh, am in a trap that I cannot uh, free myself from, I'll see you all down the road.